Jonah chapter 4, starting with verse 1, the Word of God says, but to Jonah this seemed very wrong. Remember, God just changed his mind in chapter 3, verse 10. So in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, but to Jonah this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life for it is better for me to die than to live but the Lord replied is it right for you to be angry let us pray father thank you so much for this experience that we are about to have as we unpack chapter 4 and we unpack your heart lay it all over these pages that we may understand you and know you better. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. amen and amen. So I'm glad we cleared this up. I always thought that Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because the people were so bad, he was afraid they might harm him. That's what I was taught growing up. We find out the reason why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh is because he didn't want God to show them mercy. Yes, there might have been some element of uh, being perceived as a false prophet because what he had foretold did not come about. But in this particular situation, he's upset because he knew that God would relent. God would change his mind. And how could Jonah know this? How could he know this? Is this the first time he's prophesied? Prophecy has a way of opening up the windows for us to see down the corridors of time. Prophecy, like a doctor, will show us the trajectory of our life if we don't get our act together, start eating better, start exercising. That prophet, your doctor, will tell you what life will be like. God often uses prophecy to let cities and people know that if they don't change their way, they are driving down into a dark, dark place. But when people respond, oh, God loves that. When people repent, oh, God loves that. When they change their mind, God will change his because they've listened to the doctor's orders, amen? They begin to get on that treadmill. They, they look at what they have in their refrigerator. Now you guys are going to go back home and be so much healthier because of this sermon. They're getting their stuff together. But Jonah did not want this to happen for Nineveh because he knew they didn't deserve it. They really didn't deserve it. Now, I don't have time to, to really dig deep into this. We talked about it a little bit last week, that, that Nineveh was called this, the city of blood, that people had to walk to Walmart walking over dead bodies. There was a lot of cruelty. There was a lot of injustice. And most of us are very much like Jonah. We don't mind God showing mercy to us like God had shown more mercy to, to Jonah when he was thrown overboard and, uh, overboard and he was drowning. He didn't mind God showing mercy to him because he rationalized, I'm a little bit deserving of this. You know, maybe I made a little few mistakes here and there, but God, I'm not as evil as these Ninevites. Do you know how cruel they are? Do you know what they've done to their children? Do you know what they've done to innocent towns and villages? Do you know what they've done to other nations? They do not deserve your mercy. If you're like me, if you're like me, you're one of those people that has a difficult time at looking at injustice. I'm one of those people that when I'm watching the evening news, when I'm reading articles about what's happening in the world, I get fidgety. Sometimes I get so angry, it turns me green. I, I, wish, I, could, I wish I could have the, the powers of superheroes. I, 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 wish, I wish I could be a Captain America or a Spider-Man or a Superman and Batman and protect people from being harmed. I so desperately wish I could show up in Gaza and stop, a, stop, the, stop the, the senseless destruction going on. I wish that I could bring about peace and, and that everyone could listen to me. When I hear of these stories, I want action. I wish I could end sex trafficking right now. I would do anything. 
in order to free people from this oppression. I want justice. When I was growing up, I'll never forget how many times we were playing with our toys uh, in the background or in our rooms, and, and we would hear our mother gasp when she was watching the news. We'd run out and say, Mom, what happened? She'd go, no, 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 and she would turn the TV off. No, 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 no. Mom, tell us what happened. No, no, something, oh, oh. This is what she said with Jesus is coming soon. Anybody grew up in those type of households? Oh, Jesus is coming soon, boys. Jesus is coming soon. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. Many people, when they see the world in flux, when they see the world blind in rage and, and jealousy, when they, when they see the greed, they just can't help but say, oh, Jesus, come soon, come soon, come soon, Lord. It's wrapping up, my mom would say. Time is short. We've been doing this especially as Adventists, waiting for Jesus' second coming. And when we see all the atrocities in this world, oh, Lord, how much longer? Jonah is in this place. No, God, they don't deserve your mercy. They deserve judgment. They are guilty. These are sick, sick People, this great city needs to be shown the door. But God asked this question, and this is a hard question. Why are you so angry? Jonah says to him, I I I'm angry enough to die. I'm so angry. Have you been there before? So upset? so angry, wanting justice that it takes your breath away? Have you been that person that you gasp? Jonah, literally, his breath is taken away by God's mercy, but he's angry. I cannot believe it. Actually, I can. This is what you always do, and this is why I didn't want to be here. So watch what God says. Why are you so angry? Verse 5 says, Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. In verse 5, there he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Huh. He already knew God changed his mind. Now he's hoping God changes his mind again. Oh, Lord, I hope you get upset. I hope there's some people that, that slip up in that city and you know they're not deserving of it and, and, and you end them for good. Just going to sit back and observe. Now, it's really interesting here because as a prophet, a man of God, you would think that he would take advantage of this opportunity to go into the city and teach them more about Jesus, right? <laughs> right? I mean, you would think he would have some worship experience with them and say, oh, I'm so glad that you turned your hearts to Jehovah. Oh, he's a wonderful God. His, his love is abounding. He's so patient. He's so merciful. He relents from sending calamity. You would have thought he would have used this description of God in verses 1 and 2 to to, to share with the rest of the Ninevites to let them know this is the God I serve. Nope, he packed his Bible. He walked away at a distance. I hope they burn. Have we ever been like that as a church? Where we look at people and we say, oh, I don't want them in this church. Not in this church, pastor. Not in this church. Not with all that mess. Absolutely. They're flagrant with their sin, pastor. We need to put an end to this. We need to make an example of them. And we just stand back at a distance like Jonah, just watching them. So often we almost feel like this is our right and we're upset. We lose our breath in board meetings, business meetings. Oh, I can't believe their name is still in the books after what they did. But God keeps asking us the question, why are you so angry? Oh, Lord, I'm angry because I love righteousness. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. No, pastor. Listen, listen, pastor. We must hate the sin, but we can love the sinner. But while they're sinning, we really can't love love them because they're still sinning and they don't think they're wrong. And so, pastor, we need to stand up. Let me tell you something about this church. This church does not hate sin. 
Let me say this again. You do not hate sin, at least not your own. You may hate their sin, you may hate her sin, you may hate his sin, but you for sure don't hate your sin. Now, why is that? Well, you see, God understands. <laughs> oh, my word, I love this. God knows my heart. How many times have you heard people say that? God knows my heart. He knows. He knows. He knows my heart. So God is empathetic to your sins, but not to their sins. Well, that's different. That's totally different. What they're doing is an affront. Do you know the history? That's one of the things, let me tell you something <laughs> that was really interesting when I came on board here. I got a lot of histories, and it, the histories were different depending on who was telling it. And I had to piece everything together and say the truth is somewhere in the middle. Right? Oh, if you only knew what they did. And this is really interesting here because we do not hate sin. And watch this. We also don't love sinners. No, we don't. That's why I can't stand that phrase because it's dismissive and it's not truthful. We hate sin, we love the sinner. No, we don't hate sin and we do not love the sinner. That's how bad our condition is. This is why we have to understand that even for someone like Jonah, who was just praying in chapter 2 that God would, would receive him again and thanking God for his mercy and his grace, you realize how short-lived it is and you realize how self-centered it is. Most of us want God's grace and we want to sing of his grace, but it is very selective and it is very self-centered. Thank you for your grace for me. Them, on the other hand, well... Oh, Jesus, you don't know what they did to me. He's like, uh, yeah, I do. Why are you so angry, so angry I could die? And let me ask this question. Why does Jonah keep trying to kill himself? Tried to kill himself in chapter 1, being thrown overboard. Now he wants to die when God shows his mercy. God's mercy makes him so angry he would rather be dead than alive. Let that sink in for a while. Take my breath away. Now that phrase, take my breath away, is more famous and more connected to something akin to romance, right? Some of you may remember the song, take my breath away. Uh, Beyonce has some weird version that I know none of you have ever heard, praise the Lord. It's not, it's not in the hymn, hymnal, not at all. Um, and we usually say that when we are confronted with somebody's beauty, right? You, you, fall, you fall in love for the, at first sight. You've ever, anybody ever had a fall in love for the first sight experience? If you have not with the person you've come to church with, do not raise your hand. But anybody? Anybody? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've had that experience. Time slowed down for me. It happened in the church. Time slowed down for me. I said, ooh, is this the Holy Spirit? It later blossomed into my son, Nathan, so it was all good. And then I remember when Nathan was born, my breath was taken away. I began to gasp. <gasps> I was crying and laughing at the same time. Oh. We lose our breath when we cannot find words, when something is so extraordinary. One of the definitions of that phrase, that idiom, take my breath away, is to be overwhelmed with someone's beauty or grandeur, to be surprised or astounded with someone. Take my breath away. So God has an illustration for Jonah. As Jonah's waiting, he causes a plant to grow to shade him because it's scorching hot that day. And this plant grows so quickly, Jonah knows something miraculous about it. And he's so grateful for the shade, but then the Bible says that God sends a worm to destroy this plant. And this worm, this is, we're in verse, uh, we're in verse 7, 
uh, 8 and 9, it says that this, this worm, it chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun, the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint, and he wanted to die again. It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, Jonah says. I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. (laughs) My man, there's bigger issues in the world, right? He who can tell Jonah kind of has some uh, challenges, right? Praise God that he calls all kinds of people. Amen? He doesn't wait for us to be perfect, perfect ambassadors. He calls us with all of our dysfunction and says, I'll use you, Jonah. I'll use you, Peter. I'll use you, Judas. I'll use you, Martha, Mary. I'll use you, Ruth. So, so, so he's upset. He's upset. But then God teaches us this beautiful lesson. But the Lord said in verse 10, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. He's basically saying you did nothing to produce this plant. You did nothing to nurture it or grow it. You have no idea how this plant even showed up. But here you are concerned as if you played a big part in it. You're so upset as if you were owed this plant and that you needed the explanation. No, no, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their left hand from their right hand as well as many animals? Oh, can I just pause there for a second? God wanted to spare Nineveh because of the cats and the dogs. God wanted to spare Nineveh for the chickens and the cows. So don't eat them. Amen? (laughs) God chose to spare a city for the goldfish. His eye is on the sparrow, so you know it's on the chicken McNuggets. Somebody say amen. Amen. He said there are innocent wildlife in this city, and there's innocent people in the city, 120,000 that are ignorant and don't know any better, meaning God was sparing the city for the sake of those who were ignorantly doing what they were doing. Now, how does this illustration connect? This illustration of the plant connect with what God is stating about Nineveh? Because God was there when the Ninevites were born. God was there in the delivery room. God saw the dysfunction of the parents. God saw the want and violence that influenced and impacted people in the city. God understands what shapes us as sinners. So when he looks at us, there is a level of compassion and mercy that we who know nothing can ever have. So we'll look at a person and say, he cheated on me. How dare he's a dog. And God says, you should have seen how the divorce hurt him. He was 12 years old. And from 12 to 14, he would cry every single night. He thought it was his fault. I was there. So I know why there is a disconnect with his heart. I know why he has an issue trusting people and really opening up and being vulnerable. What you simply judge as a byproduct of hip-hop culture, I know better. What you may look at as behavior with all the piercings, that they're just simply, they're a part of the grunge culture. I, I know better because I was there. And don't think for a second this is just attributed to this particular situation. Even in Jesus' ministry, he talked about it. Even in Matthew, in Matthew uh, uh, chapter 12, Jesus talks about Jonah and Nineveh. When they were asking for a sign, Jesus said, the only sign I'm going to give you is the sign of Jonah. As he was in the belly for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. Jesus was talking about his death 
his, his, his salvific act of mercy and love on the behalf of all humanity. Just as God was going to spare Nineveh for the innocent animals and the innocent lives, God is going to spare us for the innocent life of his son. When we are judged at the end of time, we are not judged by our own good acts and our own good deeds. We are judged based on the righteousness of Jesus. It is for Jesus' sake that we will be saved. In other words, Jesus is basically going to say this to his dad, I want them. And the dad says, I know, I wanted them too. That's why I sent you. He says, he says in, in chapter 12 of Matthew that the men of Nineveh will one day stand up at the judgment with, and condemn this generation. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something, someone greater than Jonah is here. Go down to Matthew uh, 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 chapter 11. Look, look at Matthew chapter 11. Go back, verse 23 and 24. Watch what Jesus says here when speaking, when speaking about Sodom and Gomorrah, another wicked city that we would believe is an example of what's going to happen to those in the end because they were, they were evil, they were sinners. Watch what he says. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that, had were, that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. More bear, wait, more bearable? What do you mean more bearable, Jesus? More bearable. Bearable sounds survivable, doesn't it? If I were to tell you that cancer is bearable, you would say you survived it. He says more bearable. And he mentions other wicked cities and nations talking about if the works that had been done here had been done there, they would have repented long ago. Meaning this, Jesus knew their hearts so well that he could actually uh, uh, retroactively apply his life and his ministry to cities where he never showed up. Oh, I need to break this one down. According to 1 Peter chapter 3, when Jesus died, Peter says this most mysterious thing, that when Jesus died in the flesh, he was made alive in the spirit, and he went and he began to proclaim to the trapped spirits all the way back before the flood, the antediluvian world. It is a mysterious text. We really don't know what to do with it. It's one of those texts that we wish were not there as Adventists. But can I just say something to you? I believe that text is simply saying this, that when Jesus died, his work, his ministry, and his blood went far back to the days of Noah and applied it to them as well. Meaning, because of what Jesus did at Calvary, what Jesus did at Calvary, there will be those that seemingly were lost that will be found. Because God could say, if they knew me, oh, that's a good word, if she had known me, if the works that had been done here been done there, I know her heart well enough, I know it better than I know the plant, Jonah, and I'm telling you right now, I judge hearts, not deeds. I judge hearts, and I can apply my grace how I choose. That's what makes him the righteous judge. That's what makes him appropriate to be able to say these kind of things. It will be more bearable. Think about this for a second. There is a possibility there will be those who missed the first boat when the flood came, did not make it on the first boat with Noah, but might make it on the second boat with Jesus. Oh, y'all don't even love Jesus. Did you just hear what I said? <laughs> There are some children, babies, people that didn't even have a choice to get on the boat who perished that Jesus says, I got them. There are some people that never understood exactly what Noah was saying and they were ignorant. They didn't know their left hand from their right hand. And Jesus said, hey, listen, there's going to be a flood. I'm, I, I, I gave you a boat. Had so many people repented that there wasn't enough room on the boat, God would have never sent the rain. He'd been like, all right. Y'all have been turned. <laughs> no need to overthrow. No need to pit the reset button with the flood of water because now you have the flood of the Holy Spirit. So we won't bring on this calamity. But just imagine some who drowned back then will be drowning in God's love in the hereafter. You think it's possible? 
Look at his nail-scarred hands. I'm going to ask you again, do you think it's possible? But it's not fair. I worked in the vineyard all these hours. They shouldn't be getting paid the same amount. What does the master of the vineyard say? It's my money. I get to do whatever the heaven I want to do with it. It's my money. It's my blood. It's my grace. If I want to apply it to Hitler, what's it to you? Well, it's not fair. I'm sorry, honey. Grace ain't fair. Well, someone should pay. I already did. Look to Calvary. God says, I have already have. I loved you so much that it took my breath away. God wants to meet you face to face, Nineveh. He wants to reach you where you are in your ignorance. He wants to apply his grace to your situation. For God so loved. Oh, family, I do believe that wickedness needs to end. I believe that there will be a judgment. I'm not saying there will not be, but the judgment will not be about people who missed out because they didn't know. The ones that miss out are the ones that do know and rebel. The ones that do know like Lucifer and reject. But the ones where there's ignorance and there wasn't light, God can look at that situation and say, my grace is sufficient. That's why there will be some that were in the church all these days and said, Lord, did we not? Did we not? Did we not? He says, yes, but I know your heart well enough to know you would hate it living with me because you're not going to be the king. Why are you so angry? Family, I believe that when we look to the cross, our anger should leave but you don't know what that, what that perpetrator did to me. Jesus says, I know, and that's why I gave my life. Be angry with me. I'll pay the price. Yell at me. It's my fault. Say crucify him to me. You know the person who abused you was also abused. I'm angry with sin as well, but I'm so angry I did something about it. Into thy hands I give my breath. Take it away, Father. Jesus loses his breath for you. And one day, family, you are going to see him face to face. And he may be standing right next to your greatest enemy. And it's going to take your breath away. But this time for the right reasons. For God so loved and we love because he first loved us. He's always loving, always patient, always kind, always relenting from sending calamity. It's just who he is. God is love. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much. For this challenge that you've given us, Oh, you so love us. Now, we know you hate sin. <laughs> we know you hate sin so much it killed you. So we know that. We look to Calvary to know how much you hate sin. But we also look to Calvary to know how much you love sinners. Thank you for your empathy. Thank you for understanding our situation. Thank you for understanding our ignorance and our weakness and our depravity and all of those things. And Thank you for putting on not rose-colored lenses, but, but grace-colored glasses so that you can see our condition. Thank you because of one man's sin, we all became sinners and death ensued. But because of one man's righteous act, all are justified. So Jesus, thank you for saving us, not because of our innocence, but because of yours. This is the gospel through and through. And although this story doesn't tell us what Jonah's final response is, it's up to us. We're Jonah. How are we going to respond? Thank you for this challenge. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. God bless you.